we can make sure we are all up and running and our technology is working, but we are so glad you guys have spent your extra day of the year here with us at UWorld on our Live and Learn to learn about AFib. So um, thanks for joining us. Um, we have friends joining us from all different social media uh, channels. So hello to TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Um, while we get started, go ahead and drop in the chat uh, where you're joining us from and if you joined us last week or anything fun about Leap Day. Maybe you're doing something really exciting today. More excite, less, can't be quite as exciting as learning about AFib, but I'm sure something pretty close. So um, we're so glad you guys are here and give us just a second and we will get started. Okay, all right, we got the green light, so we'll go ahead and jump in. Um, welcome again, everybody. My name is Jackie, and I am a registered nurse. I work here at UWorld on our nursing education team, and to have the opportunity to spend more time with all of you guys through these live and learn experiences. Um, we saw your comments from last week and what you guys wanted to see more of. Um, so we had a lot of requests for mental health and psych topics, um, farm, and even more cardiac. So next week, we will have two live and learn sessions with one of our outstanding nurses on our team, Valerie. And she's gonna talk to you guys about delirium versus dementia and multiple sclerosis as well. So we have a little psych, a little neuro, a little musculoskeletal, um, but we are here to help you guys and we want to be sure you guys come back and watch these. So continue leaving us comments about other topics you want to see. Um, we read them, so uh, don't hold back. Let us know what you're thinking. <laughs> Um, okay, so we are rounding out Heart Month with one last heart topic. Uh, today we're going to talk about one of the most common dysrhythmias, which is atrial fibrillation. So during our time together, we're going to talk about the basics of electrical conduction of the heart muscle, um, what that looks like on an ECG strip, risk factors, manifestations, and treatment for AFib. So again, please interact with us. Uh, make sure and drop some questions in the chat. Let us know how we are doing. We love to hear from you guys. Okay, so let's jump in. We're going to start with a question so we can keep some of this information in the back of our head as we are learning. So we'll go ahead and pull the question up. Um, the question says, the nurse is caring for a client with newly diagnosed atrial fibrillation. Which of the following actions should the nurse take? Select all that apply. So we have option one, administer atropine to the client. Option two, prepare the client for defibrillation. Option three, teach the client about anticoagulation therapy. Option four, initiate continuous cardiac monitoring for the client. And option five, instruct the client to perform the Valsalva maneuver. So starting at the beginning of that question, we know we need to know about AFib and specifically nursing interventions to answer this question. We also see those four words that can elicit fear in us, select all that apply. So this is going to key us in that this question is going to have multiple correct answers. So when we read the options, we are going to take a true false approach. So the statements that we find to be true are going to be our correct answers. Um, again, feel free to drop your answers in the chat, but we're going to revisit this at the end and see how we did. Okay, so let's talk AFib. Um, just to test everyone's knowledge, we're going to start off with a little question. So drop your answer in the chat. The question is, where do electrical impulses start in the heart? Where do electrical impulses start in the heart? Let's see what we got. Oh, look at this. We've got a lot of people coming in, answering. Amazing. All right, I'm starting to see some of those right answers come through. You guys are right. Yes, SA node. So last week we talked about the path, I should say SA node, also known as sinoatrial node. <laughs> um, so last week we talked about the path um, blood flows through the heart, and this week we're going to learn about the electrical circuit that occurs to allow the heart to do this, and then what causes that atrial fibrillation. 
So a quick refresher on blood flow. Um, remember that the heart is alphabetical. So atrium are over ventricles, so A over V. So our deoxygenated blood is gonna enter through the right side of the heart. We're going right atrium to right ventricle. And then this blood is pushed through the um, pulmonary artery to the lungs to get oxygen. We oxygenate up and our oxygenated blood is gonna travel through the pulmonary veins to the right side of the heart. So right, or left side of the heart, I'm sorry. <laughs> left atrium, left ventricle, where it's finally pushed out of the body through the aorta. So now in order for this path to happen, our heart muscle has to have power or electricity behind it. So this electricity is gonna cause the perfect dance between our atrium and ventricles, allowing blood to fill and empty through the chambers of the heart. So with this in mind, let's talk about what normal conduction looks like. So the electrical current in our heart is gonna start with the SA node, which is found in our atrium. So picture like a little dot at the top of our atrium. When this fires, you can think of it as lighting a fuse that surrounds the atrium. So that spark is going to travel around our atriums and get that tissue nice and tingly and fired up and ready to contract. So at the same time our spark is traveling around our atriums, these chambers, the left and right atrium, are filling up with blood. So when those chambers reach max capacity with blood and max like excitability and electricity, the atrium are going to contract and push that blood down into the ventricles. So the electrical baton is going to get passed to a new and much more powerful circuit at this point too, which is called the AV node or atrioventricular node. So the AV node is what's gonna relay our atrial impulse um, down into our ventricles. So we'll pause and recap. We started with our SA node, which generates our electrical impulse that travels around the atrium. This impulse is going to ignite our AV node or atrioventricular node, which is going to get our ventricles fired up. Okay, we're gonna stop there. Question for you guys. After the AV node, where does the electrical impulse go next? There's three primary spots. So after the AV node, where does the electrical impulse go next? Let's see what our chat is saying. Let's see, I'm starting to see some things come in. Amazing. Let's see what we got. All right. So this is a little bit tricky if this is a new topic to us, maybe things you may, might not have heard yet, but the answer is the bundle of his, the bundle branches, and then the Purkinje fibers. And I think Purkinje fibers is just a fun thing to say. Okay, so we know our ventricles are bigger than our atrium, so they're gonna require a lot more electricity to power up and make that big squeeze we need to push blood through um, our arteries to either our lungs or our body. So with this being said, when that fuse starts at the AV node, it's going to need to activate like a whole team. So that impulse is going to travel through the bundle of his, the bundle branches, and the Purkinje fibers. So it's kind of doing that same thing as it did in the atrium, but in the ventricles. So same as with the atrium. When that tissue is nice and tingly and fired up, the chamber and the chamber is filled with blood, a big contraction is going to happen and the chambers are going to empty. So starting at the beginning, um, starting in the atrium, we have the SA node, the atrium contract, the AV node, the uh, bundle of his, the bundle branches, and the Purkinje fibers, ventricles contract. So atrium work together, ventricles work together. Okay, so now bringing it back home to atrial fibrillation with AFib, the name says it all atrial fibrillation. So our atrium are glitchy. So our signals are not coordinated and they're weak and our atrium are just moving independently of each other. So, and they're sending really mixed signals to our ventricles as well. So they're either, our atrium are either moving too fast, which causes the heart to quiver, or they're moving too slow or just irregular. So they, they're all over the place. Just, I think glitchy and sparks flying and it's not working well. Okay, so big picture, the atrium are not fully contracting, which is causing our blood to kind of swirl around in there. So let's see what this looks like on an EK, uh, ECG strip. So if we can go ahead and pull that one up, awesome. Um, just as a point of reference, an ECG strip shows the electrical activity of our heart. So it's a visual representation of the electricity going on. So I kind of think of it as just as like voltage. So you're looking at different um, points of power in the heart. 
So on the top strip, you can see normal sinus rhythm. So those yellow arrows are pointing to P waves. These P waves represent atrial depolarization or atrial contraction. So you can see these are distinguishable. They're normally spaced out and they have a buddy with them, which is the QRS complex. These are the, where the green arrows are pointing. Um, the QRS complex represents ventricular depolarization or ventricular contraction. So now thinking of this as voltage, we know our ventricles are bigger and have a lot more power behind them. So you can see how that translate, uh, translates here on this visual representation. That QRS spike is so much more pronounced than the P waves which represent our atrium. So less power is needed to contract our atrium so you have a smaller little hump and more power is needed to contract our ventricles so you have a much more pronounced um, spike. Okay, so now let's look at the AFib um, strip. I learned in nursing school um, that regular, and we're gonna put that all together here. So nothing is predictable. We can definitely see the QRS complexes on here, but there are no distinguishable P waves before them. And that road between the QRSs, it's really bumpy, it's chaotic, and it's indistinguishable. So this is the fibrillation. This is how you know this is AFib. So P waves are indistinguishable. Additionally, the distance between the Rs, which is the peak of those QRS complexes, um, they are not regularly spaced out. Um, they're not consistent. So our P waves are missing and our QRSs are not consistent. This is the irregularly irregular part of AFib. So you can see there appears to also be more QRSs than the normal sinus, sinus rhythm above. So a lot of clients with AFib will have rapid ventricular response or AFib with RVR. So this just means the uh, ventricles are firing more often to try and keep up with the atrium. So these are, are typically our symptomatic clients and we'll learn why in just a second. Okay, so we see an ECG, but we're also taking care of a client, and so we have to look at them, assess them. So beyond the ECG, when you listen to a client's heart who has AFib, that lub-dub that we're looking to hear is going to sound messy. It's gonna be all over the place, and you're gonna take their vital signs, and their heart rate is gonna be sky high or super low. So you're gonna get a lot of um, unusual readings, so typically high ones, though, um, because the heart is just so out of sync. So some clients can experience asymptomatic AFib, they go their whole life, they don't even know they have it, while others might be symptomatic. So that can look like shortness of breath, um, feeling heart palpitations, having hypotension, or even altered mental status. And so again, these symptomatic clients are typically going to be those with AFib um, with RVR, or that rapid ventricular response. Okay, so why are they symptomatic? This is because they have decreased cardiac output. So this is where we're gonna to start to kind of tie all of this together. So a big, big problem with AFib is that ineffective atrial contraction and that rapid ventricular response. So we've got problems at the top and problems at the bottom. This decreases our, car our cardiac output, but it also increases our risk for clot formation. So I'll say that part again. When our atrium fibrillate or twitch, the blood kind of just like swirls around in the atrium and we don't get a full contraction and full emptying of that atrium. When we don't adequately move blood from the atrium to the ventricles, our cardiac output is going to be diminished. Also, our ventricles are firing too often and that's gonna um, decrease the amount of volume that's getting pushed out as well. And, that blood that is just swirling around in the atrium, it's probable that it's going to form a clot or a thrombus. And we know that thrombus can dislodge or embolize, and that can lead to stroke. So they'll travel through our bloodstream and land somewhere we don't want them to, like our brain. Okay, taking another little second here. What, uh, question, what causes AFib? What are some causes of AFib? Go ahead and put that in the chat. Let's see what we got. All right. Kaiser, 
so good with your heart stuff. Awesome. Okay, so yes, chronic conditions like heart disease, hypertension, heart failure, cardiomyopathy, sleep apnea, and even acute conditions like thyroid toxicosis, alcohol intoxication, caffeine, electrolytes, post cabbage, which is coronary artery bypass graft. Anything like that that interferes with the electrical circuit can be a probable cause of AFib. Okay, so another question for you guys. How do we treat AFib? Can you guys put some medications in the chat for us? So again, how do we treat AFib? What are some examples of medications we might use? Let's see. What do we have? There's a lot of them, <laughs> and a lot of them are common ones too. So, okay, let's see. I think I'm starting to see some. Yes, yes. Okay, they're flying in now. You guys are great. You've named almost all of them. Well done. <laughs> okay. So there are a lot of angles we can take to treat AFib, but a good rule of thumb is to address problems with heart rate, so decreasing that ventricular heart rate, um, heart rhythm, and clot prevention. So we wanna be sure we are improving cardiac output and working to convert the heart back to a regular rhythm. Other things too, like lifestyle modifications can reduce those modifiable risk factors like um, obstructive sleep apnea, obesity, other things like that that help um, modify those risk factors will also help as well. So let's start with some anti-dysrhythmic medications. These are medications like beta blockers, so think metoprolol, amiodarone, calcium channel blockers like amlodipine, and sometimes digoxin are all appropriate for clients with AFib. So again, these medications work to control the cardiac rhythm and the ventricular rate. Okay, med check question. This is a good thing to know about amiodarone. What is one of the major unwanted side, of, side effects of amiodarone? Go ahead and drop that in the chat. Let's see what we got in our chat. Awesome. Okay, very good. This is not your first AFib. Okay, yes, so hypothyroidism is one of the things that can be caused by amiodarone. So amiodarone is a medication, while it's very effective, it's something we can't give long-term. It's not a very viable long-term solution for clients. So a lot of times we give it in an interim period where we're trying to get the heart back on a regular rhythm with other things, maybe like a pacemaker. Um, spoiler, pacemakers are part of AFib treatment, but we'll get to that. <laughs> okay, so anticoagulation therapy is another huge part of AFib. So medications like factor XA inhibitors are commonly prescribed. These are medications that have exaban in them, like apixaban or rivaroxaban. Not only do these, um, not only does that slow, swirly moving blood in our atrium cause concern for a clot, but there's also a little appendage, um, kind of like a little peninsula in our atrium, and it's the perfect spot for blood to just sit, stay, and form a clot. And again, we want to avoid this because we don't want that clot to dislodge and, and cause a stroke. Okay. So one of the big things about um, AFib is clients need long-term anticoagulation therapy. So that's a really big opportunity for us as nurses to provide some of that teaching and that education around bleeding risks and things like that. Okay, so we talked about meds, anticoagul anticoagulants and antidysrhythmics. Let's talk about procedures. So clients with AFib might also require cardioversion. So this is a procedure that uses a defibrillator with the synchronized function activated. That's a very important part to deliver like a low energy electrical impulse. And that's going to momentarily, like temporarily disrupt the cardiac cycle. So it's kind of like hitting the reset button, but in a very calculated way. Um, However, one important thing to know, if you, um, when you're caring for a client with AFib and they are getting ready to be cardioverted, um, that electrical impulse can cause 
um, the thrombus to actually dislodge and embolize and move, which is definitely not what we want to do. So before this, we want to um, perform a transesophageal echocardiogram or a TEE to visualize that heart and make sure we don't have a clot. And we want to make sure our patients are fully um, anticoagulated as well. So those are a few good important teaching points to know about um, cardioversion and what needs to be done in advance to keep your patient safe. Um, client safe. <laughs> okay, so another question, and this is a very important thing to know. We kind of alluded to it in the uh, when we talked about what a cardioversion is. What function needs to be activated on the defibrillator before cardioversion? So again, what function needs to be activated on the defibrillator before cardioversion? Let's see. we have, if you don't do this, it's not going to be good. <laughs> okay, I'm starting to see it come in. Awesome. Okay, the answer is the sync button. We just have to engage the sync button so that the defibrillator is in sync with our heart. So otherwise, you're going to defibrillate the client and that is definitely not what we want to do. Okay, so other interventions may include um, a pacemaker, to, which really takes over that electrical system of our heart, and it raises our heart rate in clients who have AFib with a decreased heart rate. And also ablation is another common treatment for AFib. And this is a procedure where the healthcare provider will go in with a catheter into the heart and essentially they just kind of zap the heart tissue in the area where AFib is happening. So it kind of just stops that uh, dysfunction, it interrupts the electrical um, circuit. So again, all of this treatment, it's all about resetting the electrical current. We want to get that client back onto normal sinus rhythm. We want to interrupt the dysfunction of the circuit, and then we also want to disable the areas that are malfunctioning in the circuit just to get it back on track. So I know this is a lot to take in. <laughs> so we're going to go back to our question and knowing what we know now, see if our answers remain the same. Maybe they change and we'll walk through them with you guys. Okay, so again, rereading our question, the nurse is caring for a client with um, atrial fibrillation. Which of the following actions should the nurse take? Okay, so we have, um, let's see, I think we're good. Okay, yes, okay, so um, we have administer atropine. Um, I think. Okay, yes, sorry, I have this in a little bit of a backwards order. Okay, administer atropine. Um, no, this is not what we wanna do. This medication is used to treat bradycardia, so it's gonna speed up the heart rate. We definitely do not want to do this, and it can worsen our RVR, or that rapid ventricular rate. We want things like beta blockers, amiodarone, ch uh, calcium channel blockers, things like that. Okay, option two is prepare the client for defibrillation. No, no, no. We are not going to do that. That is not what we want to do. We want to perform the synchronized cardioversion. Again, this is done in a controlled setting. Um, defibrillation is an emergent procedure for dysrhythmias like v, uh, V-fib, so you V-fib, you D-fib, or pulseless VTAC. Um, so this is not going to be one of our, our answers. Um, option three is teach the client about anticoagulation therapy. Um, so yes, this is a true statement. This is true. We want some of these, um, we want to be sure and educate the client all about this. So what are some of these teaching points? What does that look like? Um, this is like bleeding precautions. So using an electric razor instead of, instead of a straight edge razor, using a soft bristle, bristle <laughs> toothbrush, and then educating them about signs of bleeding. So dark stools, and obviously too, making sure they're telling their healthcare provider or any healthcare provider that they are on anticoagulants, especially por before procedures. So things like that. So this is definitely a correct answer. All right, and then option four, initiate continuous cardiac monitoring. Yes, we definitely want 
to do this. We want to monitor the AFib. We want to see if it's progressing to something worse, and we want to see if the client is able to bounce out of it. So this is definitely a correct answer. Um, and then option five, instruct the client to perform the Valsalva maneuver. No, this is not what we want to do either. This is the Valsalva maneuver is like bearing down, and this is what we use to treat SVTs or supraventricular tachycardia. This is not going to help our client with AFib. They need meds and procedures. So again, our correct answers are anticoagulation therapy, um, educating the client, and continuous cardiac monitoring. So I hope that's helpful for you guys. Um, let us know what you think. Let us know what your thoughts are. Um, if you want to hear more about some of these meds, um, if you want to learn more about ECG strips, let us know. We want to hear from you guys. Um, that's about all we have. If you haven't checked out our website yet, there's a link in the chat. We have a free um, seven-day free trial for RN and PN, and it's a great way to see the caliber of our questions and videos we offer. You can practice all sorts of cardiac questions, um, anything you need to be successful in your classes and um, on the NCLEX. So thank you guys so many. We can't wait to see you guys next week, and enjoy your extra day. Happy Leap Day. <laughs> Bye.